and you don't know if you're making the right decision. You don't know even if you should be treating your pet with cancer. You just want more information. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Here's your host, James Jacobson. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Today's guest is Dr. Laurie Cesario, one of only a few hundred veterinary oncologists in all of North America, including the U.S. and Canada. I think you'll enjoy our discussion, which took some fascinating twists. We humans generally expect some constants when it comes to cancer, terrible pain and impossible expenses. But Dr. Cesario says that dog cancer is not necessarily painful at all, and that your dog's most severe pain might be from a much more common enemy, arthritis, which is very treatable. We talked about all sorts of things, including CBD, acupuncture, cold laser therapy, compounding pharmacies, and the veterinarian-client relationship. She also has some very creative financial tricks. Dr. Laurie Cesario got her undergraduate degree from Penn State, was a researcher at Cornell University, and got her DVM at Ross Medical School before her oncology internship at North Carolina State and oncology residency at Michigan State University. She currently practices in Southern California. Dr. Laurie Cesario, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So you are one of the few oncologists there are in the United States. There are 6 million dogs diagnosed with cancer every year in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. And how many practicing oncologists are there in the U.S.? Probably a few hundred, but definitely not enough. There's always a huge need for more oncologists. It's such a crazy gap. Do you have any idea why there are so few oncologists and so many cases of dog and cat cancer? Yeah, there are just so many dogs getting diagnosed with cancer these days, unfortunately. And there are a lot of vets that go to vet school, but after vet school, you can decide if you want to go on to specialize. And there are so many different specialties. So when you get to what anyone's true passion or specific interest is, there are just going to be far fewer people that really have a passion for oncology. When I was in vet school, I just really got very interested in it, how you make a diagnosis and the different types of cancers, the different types of treatment. So I made sure to schedule an externship with an oncologist in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and that was with Dr. Craig Clifford. He's still practicing on the East Coast. I was just so impressed he just has such an amazing ability to explain the diseases to clients, to put their minds at ease. Because obviously when you have a dog or a cat that has a cancer diagnosis, it's scary, it's confusing, it's overwhelming. And you don't know if you're making the right decision. You don't know even if you should be treating your pet with cancer. You just want more information. Mm -hmm. And he just did such an incredible job at explaining cancer, explaining the options and walking them through the different options and putting their minds at ease and just developing a really amazing relationship with them that they felt supported. So I was really impressed with that. But it was just also so rewarding that you can take this mess on the side of a dog and stick a little needle into it, get some cells, and under the microscope, a minute or two later, you can make a diagnosis and formulate a treatment plan. So that part of it I thought was just really cool and really rewarding. Or you have a dog with lymphoma that's just quite sick from his disease and you start treatment, and within 24 or 48 hours, if he's responding as planned, he just feels so much better. So sort of the quick results that you see from the diagnostic testing or from chemo in his work. Exactly. Yeah. I am a results-oriented type of person. <laughs> what do you think the biggest misperception of veterinary oncologists is? That is a very good Good question. I think one thing that people don't realize, this kind of came up in conversation once with a friend of mine. I was just describing to her how, you know, it's hard to give bad news. It's hard to get bad news and it's difficult to give bad news. And mm -hmm. 
you know, when you're going through your phone calls and you're giving results. And honestly, you many times have to just prepare yourself because you want to be able to tell people, you know, quote unquote, the right way. And you want to prepare yourself emotionally because it's very difficult. And we feel that emotion too. And I was just describing to a friend of mine how sometimes you just have to kind of, you know, psych yourself up for that next phone call because it just gets so difficult. And she was just saying that her sister had just been diagnosed with cancer and she didn't ever think about how the doctor might feel having those conversations just because, you know, yeah, it's your job, but we are people and we have emotions and having a pet or a patient feel sick or giving bad news and seeing someone that loves their dog or cat get upset, you know, that's very difficult for anyone. How do you steal yourself to do it? What kind of prep do you do before you make that phone call? Sometimes, you know, you just prepare yourself mentally and go over the conversation. Sometimes just honestly, a couple of deep breaths. Yeah, it seems a little bit silly, honestly, to say it out loud. But yeah, sometimes after a long day, those conversations are difficult. So just kind of talking yourself into it. (laughs) Do you find that people are, now that we're living in the times that we were living in, Mm -hmm. do you find that the news is more distressing and are they less likely to use a traditional standard of care regimen now than before? I think that although I don't have statistics, I think that people are more Yeah, financially stressed. And I do hear that people are having more difficulty choosing cancer treatment versus a palliative care option, you know, just keep them comfortable because I've heard there's job stress, people have lost their jobs, or they have numerous adult children living with them. So they have to feed their kids that they weren't paying for before, Mm -hmm. plus also take care of their pets. So definitely, I feel like there's more financial stress which is limiting people's options more than it had before. And as an oncologist, your toolbox is pretty much focused on chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, right? Mainly chemo. Mm -hmm. So when that is sort of removed from the options for financial reasons, how are you able to help? There is always a huge discussion about quality of life you know, whether people decide to treat or not. So if they decide not to pursue proper cancer care, whether it be surgery or radiation or chemotherapy, then we just make sure that we focus very, very carefully on quality of life and palliative care and just really go through specifically, you know, what do we think the pet's quality of life is now get some sort of baseline, and then what do we want to focus on to try and improve or make better? And it's hard because sometimes if you live with the dog, you see him or her every single day, you might not notice small incremental changes, or you might just say, oh, well, he's older. This is what one might expect, but you might not appreciate that that slowing down could actually mean that the dog is in significant pain and we actually have things that could really improve their quality of life, especially if it's something like arthritis. The interesting thing is just that there are many situations where I see this happen all the time. Patients commonly come in and they're recently diagnosed with cancer and maybe they recently had a mass removed. And the interesting thing is that obviously that brings up so many emotions and it's very, very scary. And so people are very worried about the pain that the dog might be experiencing from cancer. I would say in most cases, cancer is not painful, especially if it's been removed. We can definitely talk about cases where cancer is painful, especially bone cancer. That's extraordinarily painful. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that I feel like commonly if a patient comes in and they're an older patient, people are very worried about the cancer that's been removed or even the skin mass that might be painful, which just absolutely isn't. 
but the dog has very severe arthritis that isn't being treated. So we can definitely do things that can improve the quality of life, which has nothing to do with the cancer because cancer is not limiting the quality of life, but the arthritis is. And there are five things that we can do to probably improve that dog's quality of life 80% within the week that can make just a huge impact. Is that because so many of the dogs that have cancer that you're seeing are older dogs and therefore have arthritic pain? Yes, exactly. So there's no direct linkage between cancer and arthritis. Correct. It's just that they're older dogs and they get a little creaky as they get older. But that's the thing that the guardians are looking at and saying, this seems like my dog's in pain, but they're confusing it for the cancer. Or just I think people associate cancer with being painful Mm. and nobody obviously wants their dog to be in pain. Okay. This is fascinating. So a lot of what you look at in the palliative area is really related to arthritic pain and more... Big picture. Yeah. Big picture. Okay. So what are those five things? So for a dog with arthritis, I would say the easiest things that we can do are non-steroidal if their organs are healthy. Mm -hmm. Gabapentin, that's something that's easy to do. Make sure they're getting enough walking. If they sort of go run around, that'll probably make them feel more painful. But nice, easy walking activity to build their muscles and reduce weight if they're overweight. So weight loss is probably number four. And then something like Adequan injections, that can really help with the joints. So that's five. Number six is probably acupuncture. Acupuncture can be very helpful. And then you can always try something like cold laser. Sometimes CBD oil can be helpful for dogs that have arthritis. There was a Cornell study that showed that it seemed to benefit some dogs. So there are actually quite a few things that we can do. But again, I'm not an integrated medicine specialist. (laughs) No, but you know a lot and you seem to be more articulate in some of these things than most oncologists who I've encountered. I just like to look at the whole dog instead of just the cancer, because I think, you know, we always want our dogs to be as comfortable as possible and we want them to feel as good as possible for Mm -hmm. the time that we're here. And it's important not to just be kind of laser focused on their cancer diagnosis We have to look at everything together. There are definitely some cancers that can cause pain or cause nausea, and that definitely needs to be addressed, but we can't focus on cancer and ignore their really painful arthritis. Makes sense. Our focus has always been to help optimize the quality of life for dogs. But you did mention those three magic letters that people talk about so much, CBD. So tell me about your thoughts on CBD. Yeah, I'm definitely not an expert on CBD. But I did attend a really educational webinar maybe a year and a half ago by a researcher at Auburn. I'm embarrassed that her name is slipping my mind right now, but I'll think of it. (laughs) Send it to us and we'll include it in the show notes for today's episode. (laughs) Sounds good. Hey, listener, it's future James. The researcher that Dr. Laurie Cesario is referring to is Dr. Dawn Booth, B-O-O-T-H-E, at Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine in Auburn, Alabama. Now back to the interview. She's actually done a ton of research. And the interesting thing about CBD is that, and yeah, I'm not an expert by any means, There are a lot of potentially beneficial compounds in these products. However, if you buy a product on the shelf, every brand has to be considered like a different medicine because every strain of plant is going to have a different chemical composition. So if one person buys one brand that's made from particular strain of plant, They can't expect to have the same outcome from a different brand, which is grown from a different strain of plant, Mm -hmm. because it's basically like taking two completely different types of medicine. Mm -hmm. The other issue, of course, is that it's a supplement and the supplement industry is not regulated. So you never know exactly what you're getting. This person at Auburn, interestingly enough, has done a lot of studies looking at different brands of CBD oil. And she actually, I don't know if she still does this, but she used to allow people to send samples of their dog's blood. Like, so you send the actual product that you're giving 
and you send Mm -hmm. a sample from like peak and trough levels. So when the active components are supposed to be at, you know, their most active versus maybe when your dog's due for the next dose. And then she actually analyzes the blood and can tell you, is there anything actually going on in the blood or not? Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. So do you recommend CBD oil to your clients? I feel like in California, 90% of the patients that I see are already on it. It's sort of like at the end of the consult, people are sort of beating around the bush at something. And I'm like, uh, are you trying to ask me about CBD oil? And the answer is always yes. Okay. Well, it's California. You guys are lucky in (laughs) Colorado and places like that. It's a little bit easier. So Most of them are already on it. I feel like... Yeah, from like a pain standpoint, it's worth trying. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have information, although it might help with anything like cancer. We just, the information's just not there. We don't know. We also don't know if it interacts with other medications, which I think is difficult for us to, you know, to recommend it. And then, of course, there's like the legal implications for veterinarians recommending it, which is still an issue. Yes, it is, isn't it? Okay, let's take a pause here for a short break, and we'll be right back. Today's episode of Dog Cancer Answers is brought to you by the best-selling animal health book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, full-spectrum treatments to optimize your dog's life quality and longevity by Dr. Damian Dressler and Dr. Susan Ettinger, an oncologist in New York. And in a minute, I will tell you how to get their book at a discount. Now, listening to this show probably makes you realize that there's so much to learn about dog cancer and treatment options. Maybe it even makes you a little frantic to get your hands on the best information. Well, Drs. Dressler and Ettinger wrote the Dog Cancer Survival Guide with exactly this in mind. They want you to have the best tools at your disposal for fighting your dog's cancer. They cover the five big steps of canine cancer care, conventional treatments like the ones Drs. Ettinger and Dr. Cesario use, nutraceuticals that help support apoptosis, supplements that fight the spread and boost immunity, a diet that fights cancer and super nourishes the body, and mind, body, and life quality strategies that you can do at home and that are fun for your dog. As a dad to a dog with cancer, I can tell you that having this book on my shelf for reference is invaluable. The Dog Cancer Survival Guide is available wherever fine books are sold, both online and in physical bookstores. And you can support this podcast by using a coupon code and getting the Dog Cancer Survival Guide right away direct from the publisher. It's available either in paperback, and there is free shipping to the U.S., or as an ebook edition that's under $10. The website to get either the paperback or the ebook is www.dogcancerbook.com. And hey, you can save 10% if you use the promo code PODCAST when you check out. You'll save 10%. The website again, Dog Cancer Book, and use the promo code PODCAST for 10% off at www.dogcancerbook.com. And we're back. Let's talk a little bit about the finances associated with cancer. We get so many questions from people saying, oh, this is so expensive. Mm -hmm. What's the average cost of traditional standard of care, meaning chemotherapy in California? I'm sure there's a range. Yeah, it varies widely on location, even within cities in California, whether you're getting it at a private practice versus an academic facility. So I think if you're talking about injectable chemotherapy, each dose can vary from as much as maybe $400 to even like a thousand, just depending on what you're getting. But I feel like most oncologists do a good job of giving people options. There typically isn't just this is your option. There's, you know, a, a menu. Exactly. Yeah. But is there a range? I mean, the numbers that I usually hear are like five to $8,000 on average. I think that's probably reasonable. Like some protocols involve giving an injectable drug every three weeks for six doses. And other protocols involve giving 16 treatments over 25 weeks. So it does vary quite a bit. And then, sure, I mean, I would say most people can't afford those options. So then there's less expensive oral chemotherapy options, which 
for many types of cancers are still helpful and can be less expensive than injectable chemotherapy. So for lots of cancers, if my clients can't afford injectable chemotherapy, then if a medication like chlorambucil can be helpful, well, then we typically get that compounded at a place called Stokes in New Jersey, and the medication might be $100 for a month and a half, and then they have to come in for blood work. And that's something that we can do to help, but also as like a financial compromise too. Talk a little bit about chlorambosol. What is that? It's not something like Palladia, which is a pharmaceutical from a drug company. Yeah, Palladia is... I guess I would consider maybe more potent chemotherapy. Chlorambucil, we consider low-dose oral chemotherapy that's meant to be given once a day at home by the client, pretty much indefinitely for as long as we feel is effective. And we'll use that for things like a low-grade lymphoma or small cell lymphomas in cats or even mast cell tumors in dogs that can still be helpful for people that can't do injectable chemotherapy or afford palladia. So it has lots of different uses. Now you say it has to be formulated. Tell me what's that process and why? The brand name is pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. So there is a brand name, Lucran, and that is costly. So what a lot of people wind up doing for various size patients is Stokes is a pretty reputable compounding pharmacy. They also compound for human medicine, and that's in New Jersey. And they can formulate various size capsules and tablets. So you do have to be careful with compounding pharmacies because some are better than others. And you want to make sure that If you're asking for five milligrams, that's actually what is in the capsule or tablet that you're getting, especially with chemotherapy. But Stokes is pretty reliable. So that's typically what I recommend using. That's fascinating. So is Lucrin a veterinary drug or is it a human drug that's been ported to? Human drug. Okay. So it's a human drug, which is why it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so you found a creative way through this compounding pharmacy in New Jersey to craft an equivalency for pets that is specific to their size and weight. Mm -hmm. Got it. That is cool. Is that something that is commonplace among oncologists? I think that when possible, we like to use brand name, but sometimes brand name is just not affordable for anyone. Mm -hmm. So then I think the decision is sort of easy if you feel like you have a compounding pharmacy like Stokes that you can trust. And I've been using them for years and I haven't had a problem. So yeah, I think a lot of people use them. It's a great option for people. That sounds really interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship that you as a specialist have with the primary vet. Mm -hmm. So most people, I guess, discover their dog has cancer. They go to their regular vet and then they refer out to an oncologist, right? I would say it's either that or sometimes people are just doing their own research or Googling or they've had a pet with cancer before Mm. and they know that they have used an oncologist in the past. And so they already have a relationship, unfortunately. And so then they go straight to the oncologist. Does that happen frequently? Like what percentage of your clients come straight in without having been referred in? It definitely happens less commonly. I would say probably less than maybe less than 20%-ish. Okay. But yeah, most of the time it's referred. Yeah. I can imagine like, you know, people who are really into Goldens, they know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they know. It's time to visit the oncologist. Yes, for sure. It's hard as a general practitioner, I think, because not only do you have to be very good at every specialty, but I think it's very hard because they, and this happens with us too as specialists, but Oftentimes you make a diagnosis or you think something's going on and you make the recommendation to refer. And I think what happens sometimes is you get told no so many times that in some cases you stop offering. Mm. So I think some people, I see this online, you know, some people will get upset that they weren't given the option to be referred to a specialist. But I think it's important that as a pet parent, you are very clear with your vet how aggressive you want to be because 90% of the people out there are not going to seek specialist care and whether that's financial reasons or otherwise. So if you feel strongly 
and you tell your vet that you're willing to take off work for a specialist appointment, you're willing to drive three hours <laughs> if that it takes to get a specialist, you're willing to really invest in specialist care if that's what it takes, or you have pet insurance and you can do that, then you make that abundantly clear because if they know how motivated you are, then you're more likely to get the referral to the specialist. So much of the cost of treating a dog with cancer seems to be tests. It seems like, oh my God, we need another test and another test and mm -hmm. another test and another test. Can you address that? Yeah, the tests definitely do add up because often, especially with cancer care, we do the tests to make the diagnosis typically once, but then in order to figure out okay, is what I'm doing working? Are we still on the right track? Then you have to continue to follow up with the monitoring tests. So if we have a dog that has osteosarcoma, for example, mm -hmm. that's a type of cancer that likes to spread to the lungs. Well, the only way that we know that it's not in the lungs or if our chemo is working is by taking chest x-rays every three months. So taking those chest x-rays definitely adds up. Or if we have a cancer that can spread to the liver or the spleen, then we like to do abdominal ultrasound. So yeah, the diagnostic tests do add up. But I guess part of it is that the price of the equipment is also expensive. Mm. And often these are at specialist facilities and it is expensive to keep them open 24 hours a day. So just all of those things, unfortunately, add up very quickly, which is why I always feel like pet insurance is such a good investment. Talk about that, because I think that seems to be a really interesting point. So if you have insurance, most uh, all of this is covered. Yep. There are just very good pet insurance plans these days. You know, a decade ago, two decades ago, they weren't great and they didn't cover much. But these days, for my patients, I know they can honestly make the difference between life or death for sure. There are a lot of great companies out there, and they don't have a maximum payout. So there are literally patients that are getting thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 worth of care paid out from their insurance company. And having a dog diagnosed with cancer is just so stressful enough. Just the emotional aspect of it, having the financial component just sort of taken care of and not having to worry about that, I just think is a huge relief for people. So yeah, not to name drop and they're not paying me, obviously, but <laughs> like True Panion, for example, they'll cover 90% of the bill. They don't pay for pre-existing conditions. That's the big thing. Most don't. And they don't cover exam fees, I don't think, but they'll cover chemo. They'll cover radiation. A lot of companies will. They'll cover expensive surgeries. Yeah, it's just such a good investment. Awesome. So I know that you have moved outside of the practice to do some stuff on the internet to share your information. You have the Canine Cancer Academy. What is that? Yes. So when people get a diagnosis of cancer, they need and want reliable information. Even if they want to make an oncologist appointment, they might have to wait a week for that or two weeks for that. So in the interim, there's often a lot of Google searching. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that they had a reliable resource online. And so I developed the Canine Cancer Academy. It's basically an online company that provides educational tools for people that have a dog diagnosed with cancer. So we have over 60 free articles on different types of cancer, diagnosing cancer, quality of life is a big focus. And then there's also the Dog Cancer Roadmap, which is basically an A to Z guide for navigating a dog cancer diagnosis. It's an online course made of bite-sized videos that are not overwhelming. And I tried to make it as comprehensive as possible to cover anything that someone would want to know if their dog is diagnosed. And some people feel like they've made mistakes with a dog that was previously diagnosed with cancer, and they know how common cancer is in dogs, and they want to do a better job if that happens again. So I've even had people want to go through the course for that purpose too. Sort of after they've been through it, just to see how they could have done it differently. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, we put links to that in the show notes for today's episode. 
Thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I had a really good time. That was certainly an illuminating episode with Dr. Cesario, particularly when the world seems like a mess and finances are uncertain. It's good to know that oncologists can help us find more cost-effective options for treating our dog's cancer. I also really appreciated her input on how often she ends up treating undiagnosed arthritis in cancer patients. It totally makes sense that we might miss our dog's pain and just assume it's old age, but she's right. Quality of life is the goal, and so we should treat arthritis pain. It just makes sense. Those touchstones remind me to remind you that our veterinarians are on call at our listener line. If you have a question for a dog cancer vet, please call our listener line and record your question. We will pose it to one of our veterinary experts. And as an experiment for a little bit of time still, we will email the vet's answer to your question as soon as we get it. After that, your question and the answer will appear on a future episode of Dog Cancer Answers. The telephone number is 808-868-3200, 808-868-3200, or visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com. We'd like to take a moment to again thank our sponsor, the Dog Cancer Survival Guide book by Dr. Damian Dressler and Dr. Sue Ettinger. The book is available wherever fine books are sold, both online and in physical bookstores. And remember, if you would like to help support this podcast, get the book today direct from the publisher, the website, dogcancerbook.com, and use the promo code podcast for 10% off. That is www.dogcancerbook.com. I'd like to thank Dr. Laurie Cesario for being our guest today. You can reach her at her website, caninecanceracademy.com. Until next time, I'm James Jacobson. From all of us here at Dog Cancer Answers and Dog Podcast Network, I wish you and your dog a warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network. 